So 2021 was certainly a mixed year for Antrim Senior Hurling. It was uh, ups and downs, highs and lows, plenty of trills and spills along the way for Antrim. It started so brightly with that win over Clare on the opening day of the Allianz National Hurling League. And their home form in the National League in 2021 was absolutely brilliant. They were unbeaten, as a matter of fact, at home in 2021 in Senior Hurling. They drew a Wexford to be Clare, like we said before, and they beat Leash as well. A wonderful year for Antrim in the National League. It didn't go according to plan you'd have to say in the Leinster Senior Hurling Championship they were defeated by both Dublin and Leash and they were relegated back down to the John McDonough Cup which they won just a year previous a disappointing year in that sense so certainly some positives and some negatives uh, for both Antrim or for Antrim Hurling and in this video in this podcast I was delighted to speak with Antrim based journalist David Mohan we preview the Antrim senior hurlers ahead of the upcoming 2022 inter-county GEA season. We also touched on the footballers as well. We touched on the influence of Enda McGinley and that brilliant Division 4 campaign when they clinched promotion. And we also discussed the Tier 2 potentially coming in next year and also some other bits and bobs. Some fresh faces that might come in to either both the footballers and hurlers, the influence of Enda McGinley, Paddy Cunningham's retirement and much more. So if you do enjoy this content, if you could leave a like and subscribe, I would appreciate it. Check out the sponsors of the channel in the description down below as well. And yeah, let me know what uh, county you would like to see previewed next. And let's get straight into it. Before we get straight into the podcast, I just want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors, D Kirby GA Star. Declan Kirby GA Star Championship Journey. It's a series of GA team children's books written by primary school teacher and GA coach Michael Egan. You can check it out in the link in the description down below, of course, as well. Follow the trials and tribulations of Declan Kirby and his team at Smith Green Gaelic Football Club, recently formed a promising GA team. The book is now available in Easton's and all good bookshops, so check it out in the description down below. And let's get straight into it. Okay, so I'm joined here now by Antrim journalist David Mohan here to uh, preview the Antrim senior hurlers and Antrim senior footballers ahead of the upcoming 2022 inter-county GA season. David, we were chatting off air there. You're all good anyways, and uh, you're all set for Christmas? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I've, been, I've been counting down the days for this actually, just to get a, I suppose, a bit of a break for a week or two before, as you say, just we'll be into January, we'll be into uh, Walsh Cup, McKenna Cup, and then the, of course the league at the end of the month, so... Um, it comes thick and fast. How have you found the the club action? Anyways, I know. Uh, well, I suppose Rantrum based clubs. Anyway, they had a uh, Kickens Craigan obviously had a good good run there, nearly overturned Clan Aaron, and I suppose Dunloy gave a good account of themselves against Slot Neil. So, what were your thoughts? I suppose on on that, and I suppose on the club action in general. Yeah, at, um, the Antrim Club Championship is generally um, yeah, it's it's always two fine competitions, really right throughout the grades. Never, never mind just senior. Um, this year, I suppose Andrew Hurling, Donovan Ross uh, getting to their first final in 17 years didn't work out for them on the day. Dunloy were just phenomenal on that occasion. Then you go to the football, and it was you know, that's Craigan's first win in what 67 years against Aha Gallon, who were playing in the first ever senior final. So it does show that there's maybe a bit of a change in the guards, maybe in Antrim football, especially that you have these new teams coming through. And Portland own weren't too far away from making the final. Um, I don't think Cargan will be too far away next year. They'll be they'll, they'll be back. But the likes of St. Bridget's, I know the quarter final, they lost the Ag and they were kicking themselves really yeah. after that game, the way it panned out. So there's, there seems to be quite a few clubs there with uh, realistic ambitions of um, going all the way. Yeah, I suppose that's the main positive as well, because if you have more clubs competing at the highest level of Antrim senior football, yeah. you know, there'll be more more pool of options for players, there'll be more options for players to come through for end of McGinley and whatnot. So I'd imagine that's a, a big positive as well, I, I suppose, for Antrim football. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, th there was a couple of names. No, uh, I think it's Jamie McCann is maybe going to be part of the Antrim senior panel next year. He's coming through um, from the Craigan team. There's a couple of other lads there that could really make an impact, um, especially with my gal. I know a few of them have been there in the last couple of years, Alex Rory McCann, um, but he really sort of stepped up this year a bit. Uh, just read a few things there last week that there's a few lads who are stepping away. Paddy Cunningham's the obvious one, and um, the Evergreen mm. Paddy. It's going to be huge shoes to fill there. Um, because just the guy, if you give him an inch of space, he's going to kick a point and, and some massive scores really for Antrim this year, which, which he got and he led a hand in. Like some Mark Sweeney, he's based in Dublin. He's don't think he's coming back next year. Um, Al Delargy, Al McKeever, and actually one of the Agal lads, um, Adam Lochran, I think is maybe. Going to take a year out. He's in university in Dublin, so maybe it's just getting a bit, uh, bit too much 
in that regard. But yeah, as you say, um, there's been plenty of fellas who've put their hand up over the course of the last couple of months, and they've definitely given and this was some some food for thought. Yeah, like I remember saying some of Paddy Cunningham's points. All right, I think in the division division four of the league, I think I remember late on against Sligo or something like that coming off the bench. Like it's kind of crazy how he still finds that same energy and and same sort of. I suppose, skill and athleticism to be kicking those points even at, at such a late age. And I'd imagine he'll definitely be a big miss now for the Antrim footballers in 2022. Oh, big time, Amy. You mentioned that score against Sligo. He's brought on late in the game. He had a bit of a bit part role in 2021, just maybe getting 10 minutes here and there. But what he did in those 10 minutes was massive. I mean, not that point against Sligo, which won the game, that really, that, that was kind of catapulted Antrim into the, well, it wasn't the finals of Web Panda. There were two semifinals this year. We didn't get the finals in Division 4, but... Um, yeah, that was a massive point because it really would have put them behind um, behind the eight ball, really, um, getting into that last game against Leitrim. And um, whether we're sort of, yeah, we already knew that they were through to to a semi final, which was a de facto playoff playoff game down in Waterford. But yeah, Paddy, I mean, over the years, even when he was away from the county scene, watching him playing for La Viarg, some of the points he was kicking really for the club, pivotal in their run to the Antrim title 2017, and still. Um, even 36, he's still probably the best forward in the county, but um, maybe just it's got to the point now where it's time to hang, hang the boots up. Yeah, and I suppose focusing in on the Antrim hurlers, I suppose, first of all, and then uh, we'll, we'll touch on the footballers a little bit later, but I suppose how would you look back then and reflect on the 2021 season for Antrim? I mean, some highs and lows, plenty of trills and spills, brilliant in the league, maybe not so good in the championship, but how would you look back on it now? I suppose would it have been, what, five, six months on? Yeah, it's all very, very much a mixed bag. I think we were chatting just then. I think it was ahead of the Dublin game in the league. Antrim, of course, looked right, yeah. a pretty credible performance down in Nolan Park. Um, not so well at the M. Parnell Park, but, of course, came back, got the draw against Wexford. Great game of that, actually, as well. And it was a bit of a dead rubber against Leash. But for, for Antrim to finish the their first, um, first campaign back in the top flight with five points out of a possible 10 was massive. And... I think people thought that, you know, getting into the championship against Dublin, there's going to be a big performance here, but I don't know, I do a bit of boxing writing as well, and there's an saying that styles make fights, and I just think maybe Dublin are sort of all wrong, really, for Antrim, you know. Um, it sort of proved that day down in Navin, Dublin won best stretch, but then, you know, look what the Dubs did, they went out and beat Galway the following week. Um, very, very good side, but the one that really supposed sticks is that defeat in the relegation playoff against Leash. Um, really poor first half that day, really give themselves a mountain to climb in the second half and at one point you thought they were going to do it at least we're down to 13 players at one point um with a couple of um, sin bins and had a penalty it was saved and that just sort of you know that that was the moment had that gone in might have been different but it didn't leash managed to ride out that bit of a storm came back got a couple of scores late on and all of a sudden antrim's returned to mccarthy cup lasted about 140 minutes so you're kind of back to square one again with McDonough again next year. Yeah, like because I remember the general consensus, even speaking to a few Dublin fans and whatnot, was that they felt like this was a real tricky game. Like Antrim are kind of they're coming up here, and this could be a repeat of of 2010 and whatnot. And I suppose probably Dublin probably surprised a lot of people, not just by winning that game as well as they did, but then maybe gone on to beat Galway as well. But I suppose from an Antrim point of view, I mean there were still plenty of positives. Like I remember that Clare win on the opening day of the season, like that was a huge surprise. And I suppose when you look at what Clare done for the rest of the year and how well they played, kind of moving on from that, like I can imagine that's a, a big positive and a good foundation for the Antrim Hurlers to have that win under their belts going into 2022. It is, yeah. Um, <clears throat> they will definitely take a lot of confidence from how they performed in the National League. And um, just looking, they've, uh, re they've kind of flipped the the two that one and one B next year it's, it's temporary Waterford Dublin Leash and Kilkenny um you know they're, they're big games they're, they're, tr they're all tricky games but you know that's what you that's what you want really is an intercounty hurler you want to be, be playing temporary you want to be playing the cats Dublin really are I think Dublin have a real chance to kick on maybe next year um there's plenty of good signs for that Waterford as well um you know, Antrim will go in, will go into all those games as, as underdogs, but as they proved last year, they can they can hang with most teams on their day, um, especially at home, which they made Corrigan Park a bit of a fortress. Um, was it two two wins and a draw? Yeah. I mean, they were, you know, that, that was a good return. And I guess that'll be that'll be the, the key next year to try and bank as many points as you can. Maybe if you have the opportunity to maybe kind of nick a win that you're maybe not fancied in, just sometimes those days happen. 
you have the confidence of last year getting over the line against Clare, knowing that you can win these games and if you can maybe bank the points here and there and you know just remain up in division one again because it's imperative that you get your playing top class hurling if you want to if you want to take that next step. Was it a surprise in many ways as well seeing Antrim get that win over Clare and then you know fighting back from the dead against Wexford as well to get a draw? Or did, could you even see some of those results even coming with some of the young players coming through? And I suppose how well you played and the John McDonough as well. Like if you think back, you won every game almost fairly comfortably. I know the game against Kerry was a little, I suppose, maybe not the best watch, but obviously it was very late on in December. Conditions probably weren't the best. So what was your uh, viewpoint on it? I remember getting into the Clare game thinking, you know what, I have a funny feeling they're going to give them a game here because of the way the year panned out. There wasn't much of a pre-season. Teams had no real time to, you know, to, to go through like a proper pre-season um, schedule. Clare making a long trip up. Andrew with that bit of confidence at home. I thought, you know, there's a good chance we'll actually we'll get a, a good performance here. Um, deep down, did I really think we're going to win the game? Probably not. But as that game played out, you were thinking, hang on, there's an opportunity here. And managing to get over the line was just massive. I mean, it was it was a huge, huge win, no matter what way you look at it, in spite of um, the sort of disrupted start of the year. But, you know, it was a game, there was an opportunity to pick up two huge points. And, you know, when you're playing Division 1, they proved invaluable, really come down the stretch. Yeah, I think in many ways it set the tone, really, for the GEA season, probably not just in Hurling, but in football as well, in terms of, all the shocks and, and surprises yeah. we got throughout the, the entirety of the league and the championship. I think that was really probably the, the beginning of it. And like, I suppose there is a general consensus maybe that Antrim probably burnt themselves out in the league. Maybe they took the league too seriously and they went into the championship maybe having, I suppose, you know, overextended themselves in the league a bit. But what's your thinking on that? Yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, that's it's a valid point. But at the same time, Antrim sort of had to extend themselves in the league because they couldn't mm. go in there and start taking these games. I will take it half paced here. I mean, you're playing Clare, you're playing Wexford, you're playing season top teams. So you've got to go out and you've got to give it the heap, really, in those matches. So it worked out in the league. So when it did come to championship, that game down in um, Navin was, was hugely disappointing, really. Dublin just really overpowered them. Of Dublin were phenomenal on the day. You've, you've got to tip the hat. Andrew weren't one of the things we were maybe starting to go against. You could just say, uh, you know, this is only going to go one way here. And then, you know, Leash Antrim games they've been 50 50s the whole way through. You knew it was a toss of a coin game, and um, you were hopeful that that might have worked out and you achieved what you wanted to at the start of the year, which was stay in Division One, stay in McCarthy, and I think past that is a bonus. And um, yeah, that, that just didn't work out in the championship. And maybe was it a case of maybe showing the hand a bit too early, mm, perhaps, but I don't think there were any options not to do that. Did play Leash at Corrigan Park, but that was a dead rubber at the time. Andrew were already safe. Leash were already knew they were in the um, relegation playoff. So it was a bit of a nothing game. See, it's still nice to win it, you know, and finish off in a high. But you knew going into Cornell Park that day that this Leash team is going to be a completely different proposition, really, than what we saw in that league game. So, yeah, um, next year it's going to be the same again. I mean, you can't go and say, oh, sure, well, you know, we'll, we'll kind of just coast through the league. Andrew's not in the position to coast through leagues. They've got to go out and attack these games. Yeah, like I suppose the influence of Corrigan Park as well probably showed maybe how important maybe even having something like Caseman Park built at some point in the future, like having that home advantage and all the rest, because uh, I think you were unbeaten in the end in, in Cor Corrigan Park in the three games you played in, in 2021. So like with, it, with Joe McDonough being around Robin as well, you'll probably get a couple of home games in there as well. So I'd imagine that's huge importance for, for Antrim. It is, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's always the big thing, isn't it? Making that home venue a bit of a fortress in Corrigan Parks had a bit of redevelopment there there's a um, new stand put up terrace and, and those games they were getting big crowds out because the, the crowds were turned out because you know they wanted to watch the Wexfords and I suppose the Clare game you had sort of a limited capacity at the time so next year you would think that you might be able to hopefully we'll see how things pan out of course but you might be able to pack the place out and you have that sort of crowd hanging over the wire and it's a real it'd be a real sort of intimidating place for an away team to come into because you've got um fans are so close to the pitch a lot of noise and it really it, it drove the team on this year so um i suppose they'll be hoping to do the same again next Milt mcdonough cup you know every team in that competition probably looks at it going we've got a right chance of winning this um it's a real dog fight of a competition so it just seems to come to who can go on a run um hopefully you're back up at it next year i know they've had they've been in the doldrums a bit but they'll come back next year and probably think yeah we can kick on here um 
plenty of teams there that on their day can, can beat anyone. Yeah, I was going to say that as well. Like looking at the, the John McDonough Cup next year, I mean, it's going to be fiercely competitive in there. Like awfully, like you said before, they're on a bit of a roll. They won every game in, in 2021. Um, obviously, I know they were in the Christie ring and it was probably a few levels below. Maybe they feel they're at, but obviously they're in there for a reason. You've had Kerry, who've got to back-to-back finals. Carlo, I'm sure, are going to improve as well. Down are very much on the rise. Mead show their quality when they beat Kildare. So, I mean, it's going to be fiercely competitive in there. And it's definitely not a given that Antrim will just come straight back up because it's going to be, I suppose, fiercely tough. Absolutely not. I mean, when the McDonough Cup um, sort of evolved really out of the old Lens to Round Robin tournament, I suppose a lot of people in Antrim thought, you know, we, we can win this competition. But it took them a few years um, because those games are so tight. I know Antrim Carlo games have always been complete arm wrestles over the years. Even that McDonough campaign t- in twenty. 2020, I get my years mixed up, but um, down in Car- I took like a, re- a late rally to, to get a draw down in Carlo. That's going to be a tough carry. I mean, Antrim played carry four times last year. Carry will think that they'd be mad up for those games. They would think they owe Antrim one big time. And um, they'll be going up them, as you mentioned, awfully down a local derby. Anything can happen. So it's going, yeah, there's no guarantee that Antrim's coming straight back up. Absolutely not. Um, it will take just hopefully. A good start, and if you can kind of maybe bank a win or two and go on a bit of a roll, then then you've got a good chance. But as Antrim teams, apart from the they won it, then a couple of years before it seemed to be one big performance and one flat one. So it's getting that consistency. I think that's key to winning that competition. Will there be many cha- changes to the panel? Do you think in in twenty twenty two in terms of personnel coming in or players coming in and out? Many retirements or many even young players coming through the ranks there. Maybe that we we might need to watch out for in in the twenty twenty two season. I think last year there was a few fellas were maybe introduced and didn't really get a lot of game time. I know Darren Gleason, he was sort of anybody who's going to come into the panel, probably know they're going to come in a year before he's got them on a strength and conditioning program. He wants them kind of be able to hit the ground running. We saw the likes of uh, Sean Elliott maybe getting his, his opportunity at the end of last year and did very, very well. I expect him to maybe push on, become a bit of a mainstay of the team. Um, like I say, Shannon came in from St. John's, did quite well. Uh, trying to think else, Peter McCallum was very unlucky with injuries. Anytime he came in, he did, he did quite well. I'm not sure there's too many stepping away. I know that there were some trial games um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, I think maybe to help out Dunloy, maybe get ready for that game against Slot Neal as well. So um, there was an opportunity for really everyone who wants to be there to really put their hand up and come back into the into the panel. Um, we haven't haven't been uh, sent a list at the moment. I'd imagine the Walsh Cup and the Conor McGurk Cup, of course, the Ulster preseason tournament is going to run as well in January. So I'd say Darren will go through a lot of players over the course of the next lot of weeks between those two competitions, give everybody a proper um, crack at it. Of course, Dunlion now being out of Ulster, the good thing for the county setup is that all those lads will be back. Um, they may be filtering a little bit later because they've had a bit of a later um, end of the season. But um, yeah, I mean, look, look at those Dunloy lads. They're very, very young. The age profile is young, but they seem to be getting better. They're starting to fill out. They're becoming, they're getting their man weight really on them now at the moment, you know. So I would maybe likes of, say, Sean Elliott, um, they're really going to be pushed on next year. Yeah, that's a fair point. And I suppose as well, like with, with Aaron Gleeson, obviously him committing for Antrim in, in 2022, I would imagine is a huge positive because I know his own native Tipperary were knocking around there for a while looking for a new manager. And I don't know if there was ever an official approach for Darren Gleeson or whether he was ever even in the consideration, but I suppose having him stay on for Antrim in 2022, I'd imagine is a big plus. And, you know, I suppose trying to bounce back up to the, uh, the, the Lee McCarthy and obviously, you know, solidify in division one again. Yeah. Um, I remember after in Parnell Park, I felt a leash game, we're chatting with Darren after the game and he seemed in two minds, whether he was going to come back or not, we weren't too sure how it was going to plan out, pan out. And after a few weeks, it became obvious that he was coming back. And that, that was massive because, um, you know, finishing and maybe that sort of a low, getting relegated back down, and the whole thing could really unravel. So having that continuity, um, the players like him, he likes the players, they all work well together. Um, they maybe put last year's championship down the experience and say, right, we need to get back up. Um, next year, that's obviously a huge one of the huge goals of next year. So, yeah, having Darren there again, so you're not you're not starting all over again with a new manager, with new ideas, with new this, that, the other. I think I think that's massive. Um, they they all know all each, well, they all know about each other at this stage. So, yeah, um, it, it was very very good news to hear. Darren, I think his backroom team is back in place as well. So, 
it just seems to be yep yeah, it's year three i say of the of this um of this group yeah because i suppose as well like you've seen it before even with the the carlo manager and sometimes with a few different managers where maybe they feel they've taken a team as, as far as they could or as far as they can. So I suppose for Darren Gleeson, it's probably a big positive that he is staying on because he sees the potential maybe of what's coming through. Maybe he sees the younger players coming through and maybe he feels that, look, you know, we had a disappointing year in, in, in the Leinster Championship, but he probably feels they have more than enough quality in there to bounce back and maybe go on a bit of a run in the next couple of years as well. So I'd imagine it's probably a big positive for him to stay on because he probably maybe sees that there is a lot of potential with Antrim in, in her line at the minute. I would say so. You know, the, the age profile of the team I mentioned is quite young. Those done loyal as I mean, they're in the early 20s. You think of those fellas not in the uh, middle bracket, uh, Connor McCann, team captain, I suppose Owen Campbell, um, a few lads like that who were about that 2013 under 21 team got the All Ireland final. They're maybe just in their late 20s, but 30 now. They still have a couple of years in them, all right. They're kind of just in their peak. I suppose take out Neil McManus, and it's, you know, it's a pretty sort of young team, and Neil will be back, maybe keeps himself in great good shape. So he had a year maybe disrupted the last couple of years with injuries. This that the other, but um, he seems to be kind of back in the a bit of form again, and um, he's <laughs> central really to a lot of what Andrew do. I mean, he can play in any part of the field. I know last year when throwing the full forward, he was creating havoc when he needed to go up there. He could play at midfield. He could, he could run the game from wherever. So, um, yeah, I'd say Darren just looking at that, those young lads are maybe going to learn off these older fellows, the Al McKenna's who had another phenomenal year. Um, yeah, why wouldn't you want to stay on? I mean, there are good young lads starting to come through. Um, there's a bit of a conveyor belt of it a bit. And uh, yeah, I suppose that, that kind of helps make up the mind, doesn't it? 100%, yeah. Like, I think when you have a lot of very good players coming through the ranks there, I think it's definitely a, a great incentive to stay on. Where do you think you will finish then, ultimately, in the, in the John McDonough? I know it's a, a bit of a while away yet, and I'm sure there'll be injuries between now and then, and, you know, players probably may be opting out and players coming back in, and a lot, of, a lot of trails and spills will probably happen between now and then, but where do you think Antrim might end up finishing then? Do you think it'll be between yourselves and Offaly, do you think maybe for that, I suppose, John McDonough Cup final... Maybe Kerry down or, or someone like that maybe might spring a surprise. Yeah, um, it's, 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 it's really hard to know because awfully are coming back. They were in Christy Ring. It took them a couple of years to get out of it. I know um, they'll be right and competitive in the McDonough Cup. It, it's pretty difficult because Kerry seem to have had their number like in games over the last maybe couple of years. Um, Carlo's a tough prospect for anyone, especially down in uh, Cullen Park. You'd like to think from an Antrim perspective, you could maybe, yeah, finish in that top two and get yourself to your final when you get to your final anything can happen but as i said earlier i mean there's every team there will really fancy themselves that they can go on a run and get themselves to your final um it's very hard to predict kerry as you say you know two years in a row in the final they think that it's time that they kicked on and got themselves up um they'll have a right good saying it carlo will of course awfully going to be very tough and yeah i think it would be between down maybe you're coming a little bit far back but another bit of, another five percent improvement and down in 2022 and who knows it could be them maybe competing for a final so i'd, I'd hope Andrew can now finish in a top two position and of the rest mm, i'll i'll say carry again because i just think that there's something in that carry team and um, that yeah they, they probably think of a bit of unfinished business yeah, and I they've experienced at this level they have been so so close that they'll think you know what we just need to knuckle down again for another year and maybe we get the breaks this time and we could win the thing so i think we could maybe look at an antrim and carry um competing at the top but would surprise me if any other combination of teams were in that final yeah because i suppose the age profile of the, the carry hurlers is pretty good as well i know mikey Boyle's getting older but in terms of a lot of the other players like there's a lot of young lads in there young players coming through and I suppose they've proven as much as Antrim have maybe over the past couple of years in terms of getting to back to back John McDonough Cup finals. Like, say, there's a lot of a lot of motivation for them, you know, going into to 2022 because I'm sure they'll want to make this big period of Kerry Hurling count and, and get that and make that step up to the Leinster and Munster Championship or wherever they get placed. So, yeah, I'd say they're probably looking pretty good for 2022 as well. I would think so, yeah. Um, I I know that Antrim won all those games a couple of years ago, but um, they, they weren't always that clear cut. I mean, even the game at Corrigan Park, that Antrim won quite um, handsomely in the end. Um, I remember it was being an absolutely horrible day. Kerry missed a penalty. Um, it was howling a gale. It was thumping down with rain. And 
Kerry had a very, remember, very, very good five ten minute spell in the second half. He thought that they're going to completely just flip this deficit on his head very, very quickly. But Antrim just managed to dig in a bit and um, and halt the momentum. But you just know when Kerry get a run in any team that there'll be a handful. And you know there are a few years down the road now as well. They all, they know each other's games inside out. They have a system in place. They know how to they know how to go about their business. So I can I can really see Kerry being a threat because yep, there's. Certainly more than enough quality there. Shane Conway is the obvious um, name that always pops up with Kerry, but he's able to assist the many other lads really about the field. Um, Kerry's a very, very handy side. Mm. And who, who, like, what players do you think as well from an Antrim point of view will be the most key players or players maybe that could probably make the biggest difference? Obviously, Neil McManus and Connor McCann and these lads probably stand out a bit. I suppose some other players you, you mentioned in there as well, like Noel McKenna, but I suppose Neil McManus in particular, like the influence he has for the Antrim senior hurlers obviously seems to be massive. And I'd imagine keeping him in around the panel, I suppose, would be huge for 2022. Oh, he will, yeah. I mean, uh, Neil will be probably dry kicking and screaming out of the Antrim panel. Like, um, he, he's going to be back next year. But Keelan Malloy is really starting to establish himself uh, as, as the go-to man really in the county. Um, he was maybe... Th- Started um, as with Dunloy seniors, maybe around half forwards, but he's now become a real tr- um, midfielder by trade. And ah, he, he can do it all really. Keenan, he can pick off scores, he can terrorize a, a defense by running at them, or he can just dig. And the amount of work he goes through is absolutely incredible. Um, Keenan is becoming probably the main man in that Antrim team. Owen Campbell, another fella who's just, he doesn't seem to ever have a bad game. I mean, a bad game for Owen Campbell's an eight out of 10, probably, on one of his quieter days. It's just his use of the ball, his distribution, hooking, blocking, um, take a score himself. He's, he'll have a big, big say on how Antrim do because a lot of the Antrim attacks and how they play the game going through the lines and getting that, um, I suppose, pretty potent forward line in comes from quality ball and invariably it seems to come straight from him. I'm, I'm looking at Division 1 then as well, I'd say. I'd imagine the, the main aim there is just solidify as well, avoid relegation, Maybe claim a scalp or two over Tipperary Waterford. I mean, who knows? You've obviously got Dublin in there as well, Leash in there, Kilkenny. I mean, it'll certainly be tough, but I'd imagine that's the, the aim is, I suppose, just to stay in Division One for another year. And then it would be, what, three years in a row playing Division One hurling. Like, that's a that would be a huge positive for Antrim. It does, you know, and uh, the Tipperary games one obviously jumps out because um, obviously Darren with um, being a Tipperary native, um, I don't know, Antrim. Um, teams have actually had played quite a few challenge games against Tip over the last number of years, so that that'll be an interesting one. I think that's maybe going to be down at Turles. Um, but yeah, just say yourself that um, three years in Division One hurling, and it actually helps attract fellas that want to play for the county team. You know, sometimes maybe over the years that entering down in Division Two and so you play in the McDonough Cup, and maybe a few fellas are thinking, ah, do you know what, maybe don't really have the motivation maybe to come back as much as they used to. But now you're playing against top teams where you want to be. It, it really helps. Just keep players motivated to keep coming back to the panel. Um, yeah, three years, even what I would do for just them as, as hurlers themselves and the development of their own game, it's, it's huge. You need to be playing these teams. It's the only way you're going to get better. And it raises the profile of the county team. It gets young kids interested. They want to play for the county now as well. And all of a sudden, that there's a huge interest really about the, the county hurling team. So, yeah, it, it's very important to stay in Division 1. Yeah, I think you'll have three temporary managers in total in, in that division, which... Uh, Will kind of be a bit mad. There'll definitely be a lot of uh, a lot of different storylines along the way, you know, with, with Waterford coming back to, to Tipperary and whatnot as well. Looking at the overall big picture then in terms of the All Ireland, are Limerick still the the team to beat in in your eyes? Are they still the the favourites? And I know some people are even saying maybe Limerick might you know eclipse what Dublin done and go and, and win five in a row or be the dominant force. But what what do you think? Yeah, it's it's really hard to look past Limerick, isn't it? Just even the manner of that All Ireland final win, uh, Cork certainly a common team but what that's going to do to them psychologically just the manner of that defeat that may take a year or two to really recover from we're looking at Kilkenny seem to be still in that sort of period of transition Henry out in Galway interesting but no Joe Canning um, so Galway's going to have to plan without, without Canning for the first time in well going back to what the mid noughties so it's interesting what Henry brings to the table there but I know there's plenty of good hurlers in Galway they're maybe the, the most likely um, challenger I would say really the whole thing. Tipperary, of course, there should be a massive rebuild there as well. And Waterford will be there or thereabouts, but I just again, it just Limerick seem to have their number in these games. So um yeah, it's gonna take a very, very good team to stop Limerick. 
a very good team. And I just can't see it really happening next year. But then again, you don't know. Maybe a series of injuries. A team just has a bit of bad luck. You just don't know what, what can happen. Sometimes players lose a bit of form. It's hard to put your finger in these things happen from time to time. But sitting here at the moment, yeah, they're going to be favourites and rightly so. Yeah, like I suppose it is a long way away. So we'll, we'll see what happens between now and then. And, and definitely like what you said, I mean, it's very hard to see how anyone could really stop them, especially when they have a lot of good young players coming through at the minute as well and club players and, and whatnot. Is there any team, do you think, who, who might cause a surprise or cause a few upsets? I know Antrim has definitely been a team to cause a few surprises along the way down the years, but is there any other teams there you think that could maybe cause a shock or two, not just maybe necessarily in the Lee McCarthy, but maybe even in, in lower tier hurling as well? Um, I suppose Liam McCarthy, well, it's Wexford again with no, with no debut there as well. We'll see what, what happens in that regard. Wexford on their day could, you know, they could be an absolute nuisance for any team. And, you know, they weren't too far away from a final a couple of years ago. You wonder if they're a new, a fresh voice in that dressing room. You might see Wexford maybe kind of bouncing back a bit this year because there's plenty of quality there too. So maybe keep an eye on what happens there. Um, but then your own dubs. Um, I, I do think that Dublin team is a very, very good team. A really good hurling team, and um, they've taken a lot from last year or this year. Sorry, I keep thinking this is twenty twenty two, but um, yeah, they'll, they'll take a lot from those victories. Um, the, the Galway one, I think the Dublin, if they can find an extra couple of percent, players will, I think, develop further. You know, Dublin could could have a bit of a say in in the destination of McCarthy this year. Yeah, I think so as well. I think there's definitely plenty of good young players coming through the ranks at the minute. And I think 2021 was definitely a, a big year for Dublin in, in terms of the players that they brought through. And I suppose, similar to yourself, I'm always mixing up the years as well, 2020, 21, 22. It still feels like we're stuck in, in 2020 with everything that's, uh, I suppose, gone on outside of sport at the minute. Looking at the footballers, we'll, we'll touch on the footballers, I suppose. A good year for Antrim in, in 2021 then, getting promoted from Division 4, first year for Enda McGinley and, uh, you know, promoted to Division 3. So, happy days for Antrim. That was that the, the start of the of the year, start of the campaign. Any of the players you spoke to, that was just, it was the land repeated. We need to get out of Division 4. That was it. That was the goal for the year. Anything happened in the championship, whoop de do bonus. But no, we need to get to Division 3. That's our championship. They did that. Albeit in a pretty, um, you know, the way the season went, you know, the the divisions were split between those kind of mini groups. So you, you only really got, what, four games to get proved. But again, that made it tougher because there was no margin for error in those games. And with the first one down in Louth, it looked like, you know, you're going to get off your bad start here. But rallied and managed to pull out the win. Again, we mentioned about Paddy Cunningham's point against Sligo. Get over the line there, and then all of a sudden you're in a final and really good performance down in Waterford that day to to get the job done. So from a football perspective, you know, 2021 was a very good year. And they'll hopefully they'll be looking to build on that, maybe going into Division 3 and a, and a full campaign Division 3 um, coming up. Yeah, and Enda McGinley seems to have a big influence on the on the Antrim side as well. Obviously, having come in as, as manager, I've listened to him a couple of times and, and off the ball, and I was listening to him when he was speaking about Proposal B and, and maybe some of the changes that should be made there and, and whatnot. So he seems, I suppose, not just like a good coach, but very intelligent. He knows the game very well. He's obviously, you know, won in all Ireland himself with, with Tyrone. So I suppose he knows, you know, football no better than anyone. And he's probably the perfect man to have going into Division 3 for, for 2022. He is, yeah. I suppose Steve O'Neill's there as, as right hand man as well. And you know, there, there's another, you know, an iconic figure really in Gaelic football, Steve O'Neill. Um, you know, Antrim players will look up to these fellows, they want to play for him. And just uh, at the end of last month, we had the Antrim Club All Stars um awards night just in the Danish. And uh, yeah, Enda was up speaking just um he was interviewed just during the night, and pretty much what he was saying it's you know, when I came into the Antrim setup, it seemed to be the players had this idea that you know what you fellas were doing down in Tyrone he's got this magic formula that it's like it's not what you lads are doing is the exact same stuff we were doing and um, of course with a few different tweaks with I suppose this tactics and stuff move on these days but he's like you know there's no magic formula here you're doing exactly the same thing you just need to shed this second class citizen um outlook you have about yourselves because there's no reason why you can't go on and push on I don't know why you have this mindset so the big thing for McGinley is the trend kind of put a stop to that and get Antrim people really believing in themselves. I know teams will all say, yes, we believe in ourselves, we're confident, but do you really? And I think getting that promotion, that'll help. Get in against a pretty good schedule, just looking at Division 3 next year. You've Westmeath, Leash, Fermanagh, Limerick, Longford and Wicklow. 
I mean, they're all good games for Antrim. They're on their day, Antrim could be thinking we could win the vast majority of those. So why not target Division 2? Um, and McGinley will instill that belief. Steve O'Neill will instill that belief because the players know, here's a couple of lads who've been there, they've done it. And if anybody's going to tell us how to get, get to the top, then it may as well be those two. Yeah, and like we used to there with Division 3, like it does look fairly wide open. Like probably maybe Westmead are, are the favourites maybe to finish top and maybe win the division. But I think after that, really, there's a pick of teams there you could pick out like there's no there's no kind of side you'd say oh well they'll definitely get relegated or they'll, they'll definitely get promoted like it does seem very wide open and maybe whoever can, can go on a bit of a run maybe if Antrim can use their you know experience at home like it could be uh you know a promotion could be on the cards again or at least being up there or challenging anyways well that's it you know like a lot of those teams mess like, like Limerick and, and Wicklow um I mean, there's there's teams being playing division four the last couple of years you know and, mm. and getting results against so I mean, there should be no great fear going into a lot of these games. Fermanagh and Ulster Derby, I know Antrim's recording against Fermanagh the last lot of years they've played. It hasn't been great, but, you know, it's, it's a game that Antrim will probably think that they've got a, they have a good chance of, of picking up a couple of points, getting a result there. You're right, you're saying, but Westmeath, yeah, they will probably be favourites. Um, but outside of that, I mean, there's there's an opportunity to pick up points. The the main thing is do not get relegated back to Division 4 again. I just know that whatever you'd kind of have to stay here at least. It'd be lovely to go and try and get back-to-back promotion. Um, it did happen under the Baker Bradley years. Um, many years ago, went from four to two in two seasons. Um, but it's imperative. You can't, haven't taken so long to get out of Division 4, find yourself back down there again and start all over again. Um, that just would be... A, a, just a, a, it doesn't bear thinking about, really. Yeah, because like, I suppose you see with Cavan and Tipperary going down to... Division four, and you know, even looking at Division four, like Division four looks fairly tough as well. So you don't want to, you don't want to fall down there because you know, I'm sure maybe Cavan Tip or whoever maybe might be coming back up to Division three. But even with them down in Division four, like it's a great opportunity to, I suppose, solidify in Division three or, or push up for a promotion race. Because even looking at the quality in Division two as well, and who might be coming down, like I think Division three might be a lot stronger next year than it is this year. Yeah, it is, yeah, and you've, you've got to factor in as well the cha- the change of the championship and, and the, the Talchon Cup. I don't think we've got, got this completely figured out what way it's going to be working, but more than likely you're going to be playing um, in the secondary competition. Everybody wants to be competing for Sam, so you, you want to be kind of playing Division 2 to make sure that you're kind of in that, that bracket. Um, so teams will be fighting for lives, not just for league promotion, because of what the tie into the championship as well. So it, it'd be, I think it'd be a real dogfight, these games. Um, it'd be nearly like a championship intensity, I think, the league this year. Yeah, like, in, like I suppose as well, because like, I'm sure with the success of Kickham, Craig and, and whatnot over in Antrim, and I suppose that spirited performance against Clan Aaron, like there's definitely, I suppose I'd imagine a lot of good players coming through the ranks at the minute. I know we were speaking at the start and you were talking about, I suppose, Paddy Cunningham's retired and a few other yeah. players have opted out. But is there any players there you think that, you know, could make an impact or players to watch out for for Antrum in, in 2022? Yeah, well, listen, it's a Jamie McCann from Craig and he's, he's in the panel. He had a really, really good couple of years, actually, because, you know, Craig and were hugely unlucky not to win the championship last year. They were beaten an extra time by Corgan um, in a fantastic game. Managed to get one of their old... Um, their neighbours, sorry, this year and, and, and finished the job. But Jimmy McCann, really good year. Rory McCann, there's two, I always get confused. That's the problem, Anton. We've got, you've got Rory McCann from Aggie Gallon and one from Craig, and you had two Connor McCanns in the Craig and team. So it was a journalist's nightmare. But um, yeah, Jamie, big, big year. He's in really good free taker as well. So he could have a massive impact if he comes in. Um, Rory McCann from both the, the pair of them, actually, uh, from Craig and Aggie Gallon, are, have the capability to. To be, to be top level players, you know, Paddy's going to have to be replaced. Um, I suppose Ram Murray is who's the left footer, like is the one that you're maybe looking at there, that maybe trying to take over that mantle as your your go to score. Um, if you can find that sort of consistency, um, that'll be big. Young lad Connor Stewart actually came in this year from a young lad who's only under twenty one from Balamina. He had a really good year, really impressed every time he played. So. Can he push on and really kind of establish himself at, at the heart of midfield again? Because the likes of Big McKeever's now he's dropped off, so um, that could be his opportunity to, you know, to make that jersey his his own completely, like and uh, make himself a mainstay of the team. Mm, and Cavan coming up first then, and the Ulster Senior Football Championship as well, which is probably a probably a good draw in many ways for Antrim, I suppose, with the fact that you know Cavan are obviously actually a division below Antrim in 
in, in 2021, which I don't think many people could have predicted at the start of, uh, or, or well, they'll be in the, Cavan will be the division above in 2022. There's me mixing up the years. But the start of 2021, I don't think many people would have expected uh, Cavan to be, you know, or, you know, Cavan to be decided to get relegated and Antrim to be decided to get promoted. But like, that's a, a decent draw as well, I suppose. And like, I remember watching that game in, in the Ulster Championship there in, in 2020. And, Cavan, you know, probably wasn't the best game in, in all honesty, but it was a close enough game. So, you know, there is a potential for a surprise or a shock there, I suppose, given Cavan's nature over the past couple of years. Oh, definitely. I mean, look, you think back to that game at Breffney Park, um, Andrew were right in that at half time. I think Cavan played them nearly all the second half of 14 players between black cards. And for some reason, Andrew just lost. There was a big goal chance that came and went. And had that gone in, it could have been a different game, but Cavan just managed to. So steady themselves a bit and they managed to get the scores needed. Antrim seemed to run out of juice a small bit maybe after about 10 minutes of the second half. But to look back at that game and think, you know, that's one that got away. Um, and Calvin, of course, they went on to win the Ulster Championship. So, um, mm. yeah, I think Antrim with the home draw, I don't know how that's going to work out now because Corrigan Park, I think the capacity is maybe something like four or 5,000. Will the Ulster Council allow that to go ahead in Corrigan Park or will they move at the Armagh or Newry or somewhere? I think Antrim will be insisting that they get the home tie um that would make a big big difference as well getting that game at corrigan park and having to concede the your um your home advantage and go down and play it same the athletic grounds or so um but yeah i think once that job was made a lot of mandarin people were thinking you know what that you couldn't have asked for better mm. yeah no i think it's a good draw like i think it's a good one to to have all right and i suppose we'll see you know what the momentum or the form book is like for both teams and when that game comes around and as you were mentioning earlier as well, like the tier two championship, and we don't really know the structures around or how it's going to work. But I suppose if Antrim were to end up in the tier two championship, I mean, yes, on, on one maybe negative No, there's no fighting for the Lee McCarthy and maybe it might not be as valued as the you know tier one championship, if we want to call it that. But at the same time, it's probably a good opportunity as well for more game time, more players and and imagine with the teams who might end up in that competition, Antrim might be one of the teams who might feel like they might be able to go on a run or maybe even go all the way. Like it's definitely going to be uh, like a fairly competitive championship anyway. Yeah, well, you think back to the old um, second tier championship, the Tommy Murphy Cup, Antrim was the last winners of that back in 2000. And that was kind of a springboard really for what happened in 2010, um, getting the Ulster final and uh, playing Kerry down Tullamore and, you know, give, give Kerry their fill of it that day. Um, that bit of success can you know, can be a bit of a spring, going and winning something in Croke Park, I mean, that's massive for, for any player. The problem with it is, as we noticed, that those years of the of the Tommy Murphy Cup, that sometimes players thought, you know what, couldn't be bothered with this, and um, decided to go to America for the summer, so it's keeping the panel together. I think how the Tommy, or how the Talshin Cup is going to be structured, what exposure it's going to get, is going to be massive for getting player buy-in. As we say, we don't know exactly how it's going to pan out at the moment. Um, but if and the McGinley manages to keep the entire panel together really throughout the summer, then Antrim could go on a, on a decent run. But there's going to be some big teams in that because if you're looking at maybe 16 in it, that's, that's going to be a hard competition to win because there is going to be some quality sides. Yeah, like I suppose it's the marketing of the Taltian Cup as well, isn't it? Like in many ways and how it's promoted. And I've even said before to other people on, on the podcast and even some friends and stuff like, I suppose maybe they should change the name maybe to like the Party O'Shea Cup or, or yeah. something like that maybe. So it just has a bit more of a, a meaning to it or a, bit, or a bit more sort of familiarity to it because when it's called the Taltian Cup, it kind of just sounds like this bland mm-hmm. tournaments that teams are, are going into because they're not good enough to be in, you know, the I suppose the main Sam McCarthy Championship and like what you said before hopefully the likes of TG Cahar RTE or, or some other broadcasters can get behind it and show it on TV and maybe some games could even be streamed on YouTube for free like we obviously seen a lot of club teams do that like that would be great exposure then for the competition and it would definitely have uh, more people have more eyes on, on that competition then Oh yeah absolutely I mean you look at the different structures in hurling you know um, some of those games in the McDonough Cup and the Christie Ring are absolutely fantastic they're more exciting they're they're really highly skilled. There's no reason why in a secondary football competition it wouldn't be exactly the same. You're going to have well-matched teams, close games. And maybe teams may be playing a bit more expansively than they're maybe, you know, after maybe saying playing Tyrone, you know, you're probably going to go out and try and stifle the opposition and make it a low-scoring sort of game. But if you're going against the team you you back yourself against, you're maybe going to open up a bit more and you're maybe going to get a better quality 
match, yeah, the exposure is massive. Again, we think back to the Christie Ring Cup at the start. Remember Antrim win it in 2006. I mean, it was played before Cork Waterfall in a semi-final. 60, 70,000 people in Crow Park. I don't know what happened there, that it's that, that those conversations have been shunted away into pretty much, you know, very, very paltry attendances at Crook Park. I know the McDonough finals and play before the Leinster. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to take something like that. You know, we play your finals maybe as a double header with the All Ireland football final. Why not? Mm. Why not? Do it? Or at least before maybe semi finals, so make sure the players are going to get played in front of a big crowd, something to excite them. And you know, that that's I mean, even like for fans of counties, you know, they're going to maybe want to go do anything. But you know what? There's big all in a semi final or final on after. We probably want the, the attendances might improve a bit more. There's more of an incentive maybe to win this thing. Yeah, because you've seen that, I suppose, in the 2020 John McDonough Cup final. I know there was no fans obviously at that game, but you've seen the fact that it was on before the the All Ireland final and, you know, it got massive exposure and, and people obviously, you know, watched that game because it was on before the All Ireland final. So, like what you said there, like definitely if they could do something like that, maybe, and, you know, like have a, a double header, maybe not, you know, you could have the, the All Ireland final maybe on the Sunday and then you could have the Talchian Cup final on the Saturday or something like that, double headers with semi finals because I suppose it is about time that, you know, the, the lower competitions and lower tiers definitely got a bit more, I suppose. You know, entertainment value and, and put on TV so we can actually see these games. Definitely. I mean, I think a lot of people who kind of are forced maybe to come from the top um, counties maybe don't pay as much attention to the, these kind of games. But, you know, sometimes you know what you're missing with these things because they can be really, really enjoyable watches and play to a very, very high standard, as I said. So definitely that exposure, it's, I think it's crucial for the, for the success of this competition. It's absolutely crucial that they get this right because if they don't, and it's seen as some sort of secondary competition that's being played in front of, you know, two men and the dog later on in the year. I mean, are the players really going to think, you know what, maybe I can go over to the States for the summer here and do something instead? Like, that's where the problems start to arise. So, yeah, how they go about this is maybe going to be, the, you know, the making or breaking of it. Yeah, I suppose that's the thing, because you've seen even with Sligo, like Red Oak Murphy opting out, and you've yeah. seen, I suppose, like we were saying before, a lot of Antrim footballers opting out and whatnot, so it's definitely, a, I suppose, of critical importance that they definitely get it right the first time out, because, you know, we've seen this before, where if they get it wrong the first time out, it's probably not going to change for, you know, four or five years until there's another Congress or, or special meeting or, or whatever kind of happens. Looking at the overall big picture then in terms of the All-Ireland, like, do you think Tyrone are still the... The favourites there obviously haven't come through to the All Ireland last year, but I suppose it's very you know it's probably not as um, you know like in previous years you probably would have looked at Dublin as the clear favourites, but I feel like this year there's a whole host of teams maybe you could look at and, and give a, a good case to win it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, who really tipped through to win it last year? Honestly, hand on heart, who did? Um, I don't think many did. They'll always be there, thereabouts. They'll they'll always be have, have a say in it. I think a lot of people thought Donny Gall might have come out of Ulster. It didn't pan out that way. Um, but um, yeah, you know, Toronto fans themselves to go back to back. If Donny Gall are probably looking at this, maybe kicking themselves, thinking, you know what, we've probably been ahead of them maybe for the last number of years, and all of a sudden they come on this run, and they'll be keen to get back in. Kerry, of course, Dublin. Like I mean, I mean, one one defeat in extra time in an All Ireland semi final. Doesn't make Dublin a bad team now. I mean, absolutely not. They'll probably start as favourites next year. They'll have to. There's so much quality. I know there's a bit of a transition. The players fully retiring there is the latest one. Um, then again, Kerry. I mean, <laughs> are Kerry ever going to get over the line at this kind of um, the last number of years? They've been tipped as the team that's, that's most likely to make the breakthrough, but it hasn't happened for one reason or another. So I'd say they'd be robbing us down in the kingdom to, to set that straight. So they're male as well. Like, <laughs> Um, Mayo again, they'd be kicking themselves in and then get it done this time as well. So, yeah, I think you're looking at maybe five, six teams, which is great considering just what the football championship became so predictable really um, during that period of Dublin dominance that it was just who can stop this team for nobody, probably. But now it's wide open and it's you know, it's an exciting year coming up, yeah, because it was probably a bit like Dublin against the rest, you know, in, in previous years, whereas now it's probably you know, Dublin and the rest going for. Uh, the All Ireland, and you know, you have teams like Derry coming through the ranks. You have teams like Offaly in there as well. Um, Westmead are improving, I suppose. Galway, I'm sure, are going to improve. Armagh are improving. So it does seem like there's a lot of teams improving in Gaelic football, whereas maybe three, four years ago, there was a lot of teams on the decline. So I suppose that's a, a big positive as well. Like there could be plenty of surprise teams in uh, in 2022 as well. 
does, you know, that, that throw when it really does give gives hope to the chasing pack that, you know, maybe we're not that far. Because, you know, especially in the Ulster Championship, everybody would nearly fancy themselves any given day against anyone. Um, so this so was a lot of the Ulster counties looking at Tyrone going on winning all Ireland. They're thinking, you know what, we're not that far behind this crowd. Like, there's no reason why the likes of an Armagh, the Donegals, um, they'd be sitting thinking, you know, we, we um, get our act together, we have a good run, we get a bit of luck. Hey, that could be us. And, and teams were right across the country too. You mentioned Galway, awfully with the, the under-21 success. Um, you know, it, does, it does opens the whole thing up really, doesn't it? Yeah, no, it's gonna be it's gonna be hugely exciting definitely to, to keep an eye on it. And even though it is quite a, a long way away, you know, I think um I think the football championship is definitely gonna make for hopefully anyways one of the more exciting championships championships compared with with previous years, anyways. But you look listen, we'll wrap this up here, David. Anyway, I appreciate you coming on, appreciate your time and um yeah, cheers for cheers for coming on. Hope you have a great Christmas, New Year and all the rest. And yourself and everyone else here, have a great Christmas and um look forward to twenty twenty two. Perfect.